free and clear of the chatter from Wall Street, you're listening to Talking Stocks Over Beer, hosted by hedge fund veteran and newsletter writer Mike Alkin, who helps ordinary investors level the playing field against the pros by bringing you market insights and interviews with corporate executives and institutional investors. Mike sifts through all the noise of mainstream financial media and Wall Street to help you focus on what really matters in the markets. And now, here is your host, Mike Alkin. Welcome to the podcast. It's Monday, September 17th, 2018. Hope you had a great weekend. It's been a while. I think it's been a couple of weeks since we last got together. I, uh, I took Labor Day off, and I thought, you know, you don't need to hear me on Labor Day and um, give you give you time to get some rest. And and then I was traveling the uh, I was traveling the week prior the next week, and I was in uh, London for the World Nuclear Association meeting, and um, it was people from around the world get together. Uh, uranium suppliers, producers, uh, uranium producers, uh, utilities, uh, people in the enrichment phase, the conversion phase, storage, uh, uh, brokers, traders. So uh, a lot of people that I've gotten to know over a, a period of time. And and so it's a great get together. And we'll talk more about my view on that and what I think about the nuclear power and uranium industry. In a little bit, when I have right, when I have my guest on the show, um, who, as you can probably guess, is related to the uranium and nuclear power industry. Uh, but aside from that, so uh, I, I learned not to take time off from the podcast, if at all avoidable, because I get a lot of emails saying, "Hey, dude, where are you?" And I I actually thought you guys might like a break, uh, but apparently uh, that's not the case. So. Um, point noted, and I will continue to, uh, endeavor to do these on a very consistent basis. I had done 27 in a row or 28 in a row. You know, when I'm traveling, I mean, if you could see I'm a technological mess. Uh, so I thought doing it there would be difficult with, uh, the time zone difference. And I was in meetings and it was just, uh, I just logistically, I couldn't, couldn't figure it out, but, but I will work on that. So from that, the weekend was good. I uh, did a lot of power wash yesterday. I don't know if you guys just power wash, but you know I've been on this kick lately. I think I told you I painted my daughter's bedroom. <clears throat> so yeah, so I, I you know after the painters uh, tried ripping me off, and I told them no thanks, and I painted. I you know I said God, I should do a lot more of this stuff. Felt great, even though I couldn't move my hands for a while. So this weekend, my uh, I was in the power washing kick. So that was that was my thing. Let's let's power wash. You know my walkway, my my sidewalks, my driveway, because from the painting issue, apparently what I did is we painted my daughter's ceiling like a, a navy blue. So as I was dragging everything out to the garbage, I didn't realize, but I left a long, long trail of blue paint in the driveway, which I didn't even notice. But my wife was telling me, uh, so when she pointed it out, I, I did kind of notice. But it was oil. It was uh, it was latex, but there was other oil-based paints in the trim. And so yeah, anyway. It took me four hours to do that yesterday, but I got to tell you, it was it was awesome. I mean, when I'm out there, when I'm painting, when I'm doing the power washing, I, I get so much work done because I'm thinking. I'm just out there by myself. It, it's it's great. I love doing physical work, and uh, I get a lot of a lot of thinking done. So it's great quiet time. And uh, so, but what is my? I, I so I have a five gallon gas tank. I got the power washer you know, a couple of times it needed gas. And I, I kept the gas tank in the driveway. I got, a, I got a long driveway. But so my, I, but I keep it in there and my wife's way in the front of the driveway and she's backing out. And I'm not thinking because I'm power washing. And all of a sudden I hear screeching and I hear banging. And I look up and my wife drive over, drove over a five gallon gas tank with almost four gallons of gas in it. And I thought, oh my God, the car's, it's going to blow. The gas tank's going to blow. The car's going to go, something's going to blow. Thank God it didn't. But I, I just looked at her and I said, really? Like, you didn't see that? And, and, and there's history there. Because for oh, probably five, six years, I'm going maybe seven years now, I get a call from my insurance agent at a well-known insurance company who I had been doing business with for 20 some odd years, probably 25 years. She knew me since I was a kid. 
She said, I'm, oh, my God, Mike, I'm so sorry we had to cancel. I said, what, what are you talking about? She said, oh, oh Christina, you know, all the, the accidents. I said, what, what are you talking about? What accidents? She said, um, you know, she, over the last year, she's had three accidents just in town that I said, are, Martha, are you talking about to me? It's Mike. She said, no, oh, yeah. She said, no, she's had three fender benders. I said, what, I, what are you talking about? She said, yeah. No, she's taken out three cars in town in the parking lots and she just goes and she gives them the insurance. I said, well, how much were they? She goes, nothing. I said, what do you mean? She goes, they were for you know, a couple grand or 1500 or whatever, but she gave them the insurance. There were no police called because there was always parking incidents. She sometimes leaves a note. So I said, I called my wife. I said, what did you do? She said, oh, I didn't even want to bother you and tell you. She said, but yeah, she said, you know, I have, I, maybe I have depth perception issues anyway. Turns out, so she, after many years, so we had to go get a new insurance. Actually, it turned out to be less money, um, but now it's fine. And she, as far as I know, she's been incident free for quite some time. Uh, but um, so yeah. But when I saw her drive over the gas can, or didn't see her, but I saw the end result, I just thought, really, come on. So anyway, uh, but that was my that was my weekend. It was good. I, great, great time. My daughter. Uh, for those of you who have listened before and any of you who know my story, back about three years ago, we almost lost my my daughter. She was 12 at the time and she got very ill. And by the grace of God, uh, we we all got very lucky. And uh, she's now a thriving uh, high school student and um, uh, is a freshman and she's on the varsity kick line. And it was, you know, one of, she was, I think, I think they took five or six girls out of 50 that tried out. And so it was, you know, it was the first varsity football game in our, in our town and, and the kick line was out there and the kick line, think of like the Rockettes, right? That's what they do. And, uh, so she was out there and she looked uh, awesome and, and it was just, you know, sitting up in the stands as a, as a proud dad, but thinking about where, where she was three years ago. So it was a, it was really a, really a nice time. So, uh, and then a lot of football and my, you know, my Jets, my J-E-T-S, Jets, Jets, Jets. I mean, you just, they, they played on Monday night. They opened the season. Sam Darnold, number one pick out of USC. He crushes it. We think we have our next Joe Namath. They dominate the Lions, right? They just mopped them up and down the field. I'm excited because, you know, I'm a Met fan. And my God, when the season started out 11-0, I told you something would happen, and sure enough, here they're 10, 12 games under 500. They just can't suck enough. But, but here the Jets start out great, right on the road in Detroit. Rookie, his first pass, he throws a pick six, goes the other way, comes back, great composure. He's a beast. Jets dominate. I got to tell you, the whole town, everyone was fired up. I could not wait till yesterday. That's why I was out. Uh, power washing really early. I was out getting a cranking because one o'clock I'm coming in. I'm going to watch the game. It was a debacle. They're playing the Dolphins down 20 nothing. I think at the halftime. I mean, you just, you can't make it up. Being a New York sports fan is so insufferable. It's written. I'm not a Yankee fan. I can't stand the Yankees. So don't count that. Um, but, but my, my, my stock, my, my sports pedigree is Islanders, Mets, and Jets. The Islanders last made the playoffs in 19, uh, or won a playoff round in, in, I don't know, well, they won one recently, but 93 was the last time they won one series, one series since 93. I mean, I can't keep saying they won four cups in a row from 1980 to 84. I mean, you got to let it go, right? And I've let that go. But, but here, the Mets, disaster. Islanders, disaster. They let the top free agent go. John Tavares went to Toronto. Good luck. Um, and, and the Jets. So anyway, that's that's my sports life. I, I keep saying I'm looking for a new football team. I'm on the prowl. I, 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 I like Cleveland. Maybe, maybe I'll become a Browns fan. I don't know. But anyway, we're going to talk uranium. Uh, I have a guest, you know, I was at the WNA. And the WNA really turned out to be a little more of what I saw when I was at the Monterey Nuclear Fuel Buyers Conference in in um, in June, where for the first time in a while at one of these conferences, I saw a what I would say was a market turn in attitude and belief 
where <clears throat> inventories, you know, are uh, getting a, little, a lot tighter. Uh, the utility buyers, my belief from that Monterey conference was that they know they're going to have to pay higher prices. <clears throat> and supply production, and that's all because the supply <clears throat> production cuts that we're seeing are starting to really take hold. And, um, you know, I <clears throat> really started speaking publicly on this about April of last year on Real Vision TV. I did a piece. And then in June, I spoke at a conference and laid out the uranium story uh, as to why I thought it was the best risk reward I'd ever seen. And because, you know, production cuts were going to have to keep coming. And I thought, Underfeeding was starting to slow down, which we'll talk about. Don't worry if, if you don't know what underfeeding is. Um, but I just thought it was a, a great setup. And from an equity buyer standpoint, the risk reward is outstanding. And I think we're starting to see the turn. I, we are starting to see a turn. So, and I got more conviction on that, which is hard to do because I have tremendous conviction in the thesis. But leaving the WNA, I felt uh, I felt even even better um, if, if that was possible. Um, so. Anyway, we're going to bring on uh, a uranium guest. You, some of you may know his work. He used to be a sell side analyst for many years, uh, and now he is on the board of directors of two uranium companies, Fission Uranium, and uh, and uh, Fission Uranium and uh, UR Energy. And I I, I, I want to say one thing. Um, you know, I, I do put a disclosure uh, on these at the end that uh, that I, I there's an investment vehicle uh, with uranium stocks that I'm in charge of. You know, I, I do in, in the case of fission and and uh, you are energy, I, I own the stocks, but I really I want to stress this. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, I never comment. Uh, but when I really when I first started using it back, I, I, I it shows that I was on Twitter since oh nine. Um, but I, I never really used it. I was just a tourist. I think maybe two years ago I started talking about it and I might have mentioned a couple of companies very, very, very quickly, but you know, just general general stuff. Then I realized there's no very a couple of years ago I said well I, I don't want to talk about companies because I, I don't like the debate that occurs you know people talk their own book if you watch CNBC you watch you watch all these talking heads uh, these these guys go on there it's always with an agenda and um, you know that's I'm, I'm trying to educate people on uranium and let them make their own investment decisions and you know I I don't go and talk about it and also when I talk about it on a podcast if I have a guest on and I say in, in, in my investment vehicle, I own these stocks. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, I, I obviously, there's something I might like about it, but you don't know if it's one of my biggest positions or one of my smallest, if I own it for one reason that, uh, if I own it for a certain reason or uh, some, some uranium names I trade in and out of, other uranium names are core positions for me and I hold. Um, and so when people on Twitter ask me, what do you like, or ask me about individual names, I say, I just don't comment on them. Uh, I'm happy to talk macro uranium. I do disclose to you, though, that if a guest is on and I happen to own a, a company they're affiliated with in, in the portfolio, I do tell you that. But don't take anything from that, because like I said, you know, I don't say position sizing. I don't say, you know, when I bought it, uh, do, do I plan on trading it? Do I not? It's 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 it's. Uh, but I want to fully disclose that 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 there's a, a position there. So, um, you know, everyone has different reasons for owning things, and they have different. Uh, you know, I, I use a barbell approach in my fund, where it's a, it's 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 you know, my highest conviction, my ideas are the very biggest, and my my ideas I kind of like, but but I don't uh, um, think have as much, much upside or, or much smaller positions. So. You know, and and I don't disclose that uh, to, to, to as to how I'm positioned. So um, anyway, we're going to bring on a guest, and uh, I, I you know him at, from a sell side analyst. He's on the board of Fission. He's on the board of URG. His name is Rob Chang, and Rob has been around the uranium space for a long time. And we're going to get him on the phone. So Rob Chang, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's it's good to speak. Uh, I, I I love talking to the uranium industry veterans. Uh, I've learned a couple of things over the years there. There's not many uranium industry veterans left <laughs> because Very many true. of those have gone the way of the dodo bird, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, Rob, it's such a, such an opaque industry uh, and uh, so mysterious to many people and, and just really complicated. Um, so it's great to be able to talk with someone who, who knows the industry for, for a long time. So for our listeners who may not know who Rob Chang is, shame on them. No, I'm kidding. But but share with uh, share with the listeners what your background and 
and your involvement in the uranium space. Sure. Um, I've been looking at uranium through some way, shape, or form since, I guess, 2005, 2006. I was at uh, BMO Capital Markets when I first started out of school, um, covering uh, or helping the research team over there cover certain things, uranium being one of them. Uh, shortly thereafter, I did jump over to a company called Middlefield, where it ran one of the first uranium funds that were around. Uh, and I was actually the associate portfolio, portfolio, can't speak, associate portfolio manager during that time for a couple of years for the uranium funds there. And the smaller of the two funds were actually more under my mandate, and I had more control over that one. So I've been looking at uranium since 2006, 2007 or so, uh, as a fund manager anyway. Uh, after that, when I left the buy side and joined the sell side, I took a look at the space, really loved it. And uh, when I had when I continued my career on through different sell side brokerages, uh, Octagon first, then Versant, Versant Partners, then later on Cantor, I carried the uranium torch throughout that time. So I've been looking at uranium since beginning 05 all the way to now. And uh, after finally stepping away from the sell side at Cantor, I uh, decided to uh, join the boards of a few of my favorite uranium companies, that being Yara Energy and uh, Fission Uranium. But uh, throughout the career, um, I, I did look at uranium quite extensively to the point where uh, when I was the, uh, the head of mining for Cantor, uh, I was still carrying that torch pretty strongly. So, Rob, that's yeah, that's pretty cool. So here's a, here you are, 05, good time to start in the uranium space, really, to start Absolutely. looking at it. So, I mean, you have seen literally uh, the bottom uh, going to the top and then the bottom again. And so yeah. you've you've lived the cycle. And and if you're like me in my career, you know, the, the longer I go, the more I learn and it just becomes more institutional. You just kind of recognize things. And and I there are so many times I look now and say, oh, geez, I wish I knew back then what I what I know now. Um, but so talk talk to listeners, if you can, um, about walk us through, take us back uh, back to 05 and and when you started to see the run up and talk about what that felt like. And if you can equate it to how you're thinking about the world uh, of uranium now. Right. So the way uranium looked during 05 looked the same as you saw uh, weed stocks right now or uh, what rare earth elements a few years ago, uh, Bitcoin last year, that type of hype where there was just so much interest in that space. Anything with that name, with uranium in there, went up and went up very aggressively. Uh, when I was at BMO, there were several deals that were happening. There was M&A happening, and effectively anything that had that name in there was an instant home run. Uh, that was frothy, and that's certainly what that looked like back then. Um, yeah. Fa fast forward a little bit, it certainly has slowed down significantly, uh, and uh, effectively only the uh, only the uh, the strongest have survived so far. Whereby, I think we first when I was uh, running my fund, we looked out, and I think there were over 300 different companies globally that had uranium in some way, shape, or form, either either description or in the name. Uh, yep. Now I could probably say there's 50 total. And of that, I would probably say the quality ones are probably about a dozen. And that's my personal opinion. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely whittled down from the large group and the, the mania that was in the past to, uh, to what we have today. Well, you know, over the last several years, anyone who became a uranium tourist, you know, during the peak, you see these companies change their names to whatever is a hot commodity. I, I think most of them have disappeared. Uh, for the uh -huh. most part, um, okay. you know, when I when I think back to that to the prior turn off the bottom, at that time I think in 03, 04, you had about 23 reactors that were under construction, and you had a lot of new supply coming online. And I I and then you know you'll know back back in 06, 07, after the after the uranium price really started to go on a tear. Then you start to see a lot of the hedge funds come in and buy the physical price, and they just took it to the stratosphere. And then you, and then, and then the global financial crisis came, and it was shoot first, ask questions later. Uh, and that's you know when these hedge funds were getting liquidated, and not li not necessarily liquidated, but just getting withdrawals across the board. Even if you had a good year, you were getting some withdrawals. Um, you know, it wasn't something that uh, uranium sitting in physical storage wasn't something that they needed to hold on to. So you see the price come in. And I, I look to today and I say, wow, there's you know 58 reactors under construction. And with the exception of, let's say, Salamanca in Spain and, and a few of the smaller uh, ISR mines in the US, but for real size to come on, as, as I look out with the, the, as these reactors come on and hit the grid, 
uh, when I look at real size mines that need to come on to be able to meet this demand over the next several years, you, you need a much higher uranium price. So back then, 23 reactors, new supply coming online. Cigar Lake was was around the corner. And uh, today you don't have that. So can you can you talk, if, can you compare and contrast, if you look back through the two, what we may say are bottoms? Between the two, certainly there was a lot more of a rosier out, uh, outlook back then, because of course yeah. there wasn't a big run-up, so there wasn't that cynicism that uh, now follows uranium around from the several people, well, many, many people who have lost money on the first go-around. So that's yep. why we're putting a bit of longer uh, uh, takeoff runway, because it's just uh, more people to convince and fewer people are willing to just jump on, jump in with two feet forward. But that's in any type of hype cycle type of, uh, type of investment. Uh, the, the difference between the two really is, is a few things I wanted to point out. And I, I forgive me for maybe not necessarily answering your question directly when I say this, is one of the things I always wanted to point out is Primary supply has always been below global demand. It's, it's been like that for decades. Yep. So when people complain or point out the fact that there is a lot of inventory right now, which is one of the, the reasons why prices or the, the, the interest in the uranium sector hasn't been quite as strong, they point out to the large inventory levels that are out there. But if we, if we agree, and it's, it's factual, that primary supply has been less than prim, um, consumption for decades now, by yep. logic, that means inventory levels were significantly higher a decade ago. But what yep. happened a decade ago? We saw the massive run up to plus 100 into into the mid 100s, really. So if inventory levels were higher back then, why is it worse now? Because inventory, by definition, has to be smaller, given that supply has always been less, or primary production has been less throughout the many years since then. So that, that's one of the arguments always had in the ridiculousness of the inventory argument. I, I do agree that inventory matters. But it, it didn't matter 10 years ago, so why does it matter so much now? And that, that's always been one of my bigger issues there. Um, and, and to go back to answering your question, it, it, I, that's one of the main fundamental standing points I have when I say that uranium has to be 70 to $80 plus in order for global supply to meet global demand. There is so much additional supply coming on, as you alluded to, from all over, in particular China, but from all over. And when you look at the... Um, <clears throat> uh, you mean additional uh, additional demand? Is that what you're? Sorry, yeah. sorry, my my, my, yep. yeah, my correction. Yep. Um, yep. When you look at the additional demand coming on, and you look at what's available for supply, there is not much that can produce in size. And when I say size, you're looking at 10 million pounds per year, 20 million pounds per year yep. type yep. of production. It's really only the couple of mines that chemical are shut down, and that's pretty much it. If anything, the ones that could do it before the Rossings of the world are now winding down. Uh, the you, you do have uh, the uh, a few mines maybe in Africa that could possibly turn on, but that's the key problem. In order for the large mines in Africa, which is what's going to be needed to for supply to meet demand to turn on, yeah. with their cost structure, they're going to need an incentive price in the seventy to eighty dollar range because they're yeah. all in sustaining costs. Legitimately, are probably in the fifty to sixty dollar range. Really, yeah. I know everyone comes up with studies that show thirties, forties. The reality is numbers are usually much higher in, in, in real life than well, this report. Rob, you know what's you know what's funny at at the W and A last week, you know you, when you you look at the companies and they all talk about their costs and everyone is in the lowest decile. I, I want to meet the guy who right. the producer that's not right. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's really it's it's kind of funny when you look at it. We're low quartile, low decile producers. Sure you are. Um, right. And then you you look at uh, but but it's so interesting because. The 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 costs that they are, uh, I, I think they overshoot on the downside during a downturn. But their costs are generally higher than what they what they are. And obviously, there's your C1 cash costs, and then there's your all-in sustaining costs. And you know, obviously, on the board of a of a of an ISR miner, Institute Recovery Miner, you understand this that there are well field development costs. You have to pay for the header houses. There are wellheads that need to be replaced, right? There's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And so it's it's fascinating to me when I look at the sector and and like you, I'm I'm public on Twitter and I I talk a lot about it. I run a uranium fund. So I, I get bombarded with stuff and I, I get snippets of 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 information. But like you and I, on the cell side, I know you've modeled out all the reactors and all this primary supply, the secondary supply. When you do that math, and you and you do your own math, not not the WNA math that forecasts all these mines that we just talked about coming into production, regardless of price. 
But when you do your own math and you lay it out and you, you do closures and really aggressive closures around the world, as you said, there's not enough primary mine supply and these things need to come on and, and the costs are higher on an all in sustaining basis. And so where, where, for, for me, that's been one of the, over the last three years and really deep diving into the industry is the disconnect between the, what really is the economic reality and, and, and the perceived reality. And um, I have found that to be a great informational uh, void that creates, I think, asymmetry in the stocks, um, yeah. right? And, and, and it's complicated. And I get the question a lot, um, uh, which is, hey, where do you get all this information? <laughs> okay, you want to sit down and, and model out every reactor? It takes you a long time. That's 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 what it takes time. And um, yeah. or all the mines in the world, or the prospective mines in the world, or what the utilization rates are in the mines. Now, guys like you, by the way, when you leave, you know that's a big void when you leave the sell side because you were able to update people on that type of stuff. So um, when when talk, these new mines that need to come on. I mean, the, the talk about your experience, because I, I know how I view it. When, when you're bringing on a 10 million pound mine, it takes years and years and years. And, and, and that, that has been stopping now. I mean, you've seen people really just shut that down, uh, all that timelines of permitting the licensing. Can you talk about, about how long it takes to bring on one of these mines? The uranium is probably the most regulated commodity in the world, given yep. that it can be used for defense reasons and, and a variety of other reasons. Uh, and the fact that it's radioactive, there's safety issues. So it likely is the most heavily regulated and by definition, by extension rather, the, the most difficult to put into production. So yep. from my perspective, from greenfield discovery to actually going into production, generally speaking, I would say it's 10 years, maybe more. Yep. Uh, if it's in the U.S., possibly the tail end, well, possibly longer, given that the U.S. is very difficult to permit, although Trump has made some decent headway going that way, and that's one of the the things that he has done well. Um, those who believe that they can put something into production within four years to seven years, maybe seven years possible if everything goes well, but I, I, I think it's still a, a stretch because you also have Aboriginal slash native issues in the area and there are almost always going to be some of that to deal with. The exception to that, of course, are the countries where those issues don't really exist. So the Kazakhstan, the Africa is where those uh, regulatory issues are not as important, quote unquote, or are not as tightly followed and, or could be solved for, from various other means. Let me just put it yeah. that way. Uh, but in general, in the, your, your, your first world or your ideal locations, uh, North America uh, type of locations, it, it'll take a long time for those to go in production. And that's something that investors really need to understand is, sure, management could possibly say, we think we can go into production five to seven years from now, but it's not really that likely. Um, yep. the, the exceptions is if it's already producing. So if, if you have a current producer and it, like the easiest one, really, in my opinion, would be something in Kazakhstan where you don't really need to do much and you don't really have, need to go, have many checks and balances and pretty much you can put it into production as long as it's economic. That's kind of the loosey-goosey way of saying Kazakhstan could probably do it quickly, Africa in the same sense. If you look at North America, you're probably looking at an ISR type of producer those could probably go quicker because there's less capital involved. But then on the flip side, there's still a lot of regulation that they have to deal with. So they could be good to go, but then another two or three years happen because they have to go back and forth with the EPA, the NRA, the whole bit. Mm -hmm. um, the exception to that is if they're already producing and then it's kind of a bolt-on amendment to a current agreement, that's when it can be when it can happen pretty quickly, the six months to one year time frames. But that's really probably only with an ISR. If you're going conventional, I, I struggle to see anyone doing it faster than seven years from Greenfield uh, to 10 years. No, I agree. And you just brought up Kazakhstan. You know, it's interesting with Kazakhstan. And probably for me, where I where I depart um, with, with a lot of the consensus is, you know, we, we looked at Kazakhstan. I, I spent time over the years modeling out those mines over there. And... And when you and, and the capex that has been spent in Kazakhstan has declined monumentally since 2013. And when people think about the Kazakhs, they think, oh, the lowest decile, they produce at 10 bucks a pound, 12 bucks a pound, and that's it. Well, that that is, I, I think, completely inaccurate. And uh, you know, because of the mining they do and the ISR mining, and and as I just mentioned earlier, and you know from 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 you uh, you are energy in the industry that 
there's massive costs involved every year. There's there's those well field development costs, further exploration. Uh, you got to build out the mine further, um, and 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 paying for the header houses. And when you look at the capex decline, um, which is down, you know, uh, probably eighty percent or so. There's a lot of catch-up spending that needs to be done, and some of those mines are getting very, very long in the tooth, and production is down a lot from those tools, uh, from those mines. And when you don't, when you don't reinvest the capital in an ISR mine, you're just trying to. St- it's hard to stay ahead of your decline curve, and and so I, you know, when I look at all of that stuff coming out of Kazakhstan, I, you know, we see the production cuts, and and the parlor game that people play is, well, they at at 35, they'll just turn the spigots on. I argue these production cuts are not necessarily even of their will. I, I Sure, they want to manage the market, and as a 41% market share player, they should be able to influence it. But I, I, I go a step further and say, I think some of these production cuts are not of their will, that the lack of spending is catching up to them, is kind of how I've been thinking about it. And yes, their yeah. nameplate pl- plate capacity is, is high, how much can they ultimately produce? But you, but if you're not spending to stay ahead of that uh, and 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 reinvesting there, I think it catches up to you. So I, I think Kazakh production could be down pretty meaningfully over the uh, or next uh, several years. And the other thing that I think, uh, you know, they talk people talk about the cost to produce. That's their cash cost. But they have all of those other costs. They do have some reclamation. People always think, oh, they don't reclaim anything. They're, it's Kazakhstan. They don't care about the environment. There are reclamation costs. Those well field development costs are high. And when 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 I go in and look at the cash, the uh, the all in sustaining cost per pound, there are many of those mines that are well into the twenty dollar per pound range. And you know, there's an incentive margin. And and I think a lot of times, I'd like your view on this. I hear people say, oh, well, here's their cost. And they think that if the price of uranium gets there, that's what they're going to produce it for. I mean, they're a business. Everyone's, well, I talk about Kazakhstan, but they're not a business, but they're going to be a business if they go public. But but in terms of there needs to be incentive margins. So, you know, you, right. you, you talk about how miners think about that. Right. I, you bring up so many things. There's at least four different tangents I can take off of what you just said. It's, it's fantastic. Keep going. Go. Love, run, 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 Rob, run. I, lo- I love talking about it. And, and just as an aside, you clearly are well connected and know what you're talking about because you, you are saying things that not many people know about. And, I, and I'm, I'm frankly impressed. That's, that's, that's nice to hear as well. Um, <laughs> a couple of things. I'll, I'll try to rhyme off as many things as I can because there was quite a many things that I wanted to chat about there. Um, yeah. ISR uh, sustaining costs. Uh, certainly like any others have been declining because people are trying to save money. I do want to point out that relative to conventional, it's still lower though. So it's, it's yes. not as if yep. it's uh, it's just crippling. And that's the reason why you see ISR miners still produce as opposed Absolutely. to most conventional miners not. Yep. Um, in terms of just talking about Kazakhstan, I know I'll go back to cost in a second because I definitely want to talk about that. Kazakhstan, there is a belief out there that Kazakhstan is declining. They haven't been telling anyone that, but it's declining because the current mines that they're the, the current um, sands that they're mining from are depleting, which absolutely makes sense. And I agree with your point. Everyone is not spending that much money because there's that there's not really that much margin to gain or breaking even, or most most companies are actually losing money. So they are not really reinvesting to find the additional sand that will help them continue production going forward. So they're just doing a natural decline there as well. There's also a conversation I remember having with someone many uh, a while ago saying that the current level of sands which are very economic are pretty much depleting and that yeah. the next level of sands is actually substantially deeper and will yeah. talk will cost a lot more money for them to mine from they just haven't gotten there yet well when they haven't spent the money to get there and when they do the operating costs will be higher simply because it's deeper so that's the other thing to consider we'll see that when that happens but we need to have higher enough incentive price to even have them do that exploration work um step and, and also again kazakhstan as well, much like everyone else, everyone talks seawine costs because that's the lowest number. It makes everyone look good. And if you don't say something, anything, I won't say anything. And we'll all just right. talk about a great low number that, that's super that's low, they, which, which, yeah. which frankly is a bit of a plug for UR Energy in a sense, because when I was an analyst, they were the first ones to really come out and aggressively break down the entire cost, the cost numbers, so that everyone yeah. can see transparently every part of the cost number. And frankly, it's because they have the best cost structure, they can get away with it. But the, having that type of uh, transparency is fantastic, and everyone should really be only looking at all in sustaining costs because that's really the only number that matters. All the other costs are kind of BS because if you can't run the company, who cares? It's yeah. great that this one location is making money, but if the whole thing doesn't survive, there's no point. 
because all outstanding costs matter. Uh, going back into talking about costs um, specifically, costs from company A versus company B are not the same. Like, there are various reasons why these numbers are different. One is whoever's doing a study, yes, they are third party, but let's, let, let's be honest, these guys are paid to provide studies. Yeah. Very rarely do you see studies come out where the numbers show that the thing is not economic, right? Let, yeah. Let's just call it yeah. what it is. Yeah, you don't, studies, see, you don't see that make the light of day if it did, so. Exactly. So these guys are incentivized to have a number that works. Otherwise, they will not get more business, more people will go to them. So yes, it has to be reasonable. Yes, it has to be within 40% or 25% based on the, the rules of, of what it should be. And those are really wide numbers anyway to do yeah. certain types of uh, limitations. But yeah, when people point to studies and say, well, that's what the study number says. Well, that's great, but look at what the other m operations surrounding them are doing. And that's right. probably the more realistic number. So yeah. that, that, that's one of the things I want to say. Two, there's a lot of ways one can actually hide where these costs are. I'm not going to name company names because, because I just don't want to do that. But sure. I know sure. some, some, some miners have reported very low costs, but that's because they took massive write downs on all sorts of things prior to that. So they took a gigantic bath. So their cost numbers are lower because they've basically written off a whole bunch of other things that they should have been reporting if they, uh, er, uh, they would have normally reported, but because they've written it all off, it no longer shows up on, on, on their books. Yep. Yep. So that's, that's one. Um, the, and the other, the other is just frankly, uh, they, if, if it's a company that is not in production, they can hide behind the fact that they're not in production or they haven't produced in a long time. So the numbers that they have are no longer relevant to what's currently happening right now. Mm -hmm. The ones that matter and the ones to really focus on are the ones that are currently operating. Look at their numbers and realize that there is a reason why they're still operating. So if mm -hmm. someone else says that you're just as good, they should be operating as well. That means by just by simple logical, just by comparing that, by definition, the one that you're that is not producing has something with it that is not quite as good as the one that is operating. Otherwise, it would be operating as well. So that's just common sense that people need to look at when they look at these numbers because sometimes it's a fairy tale and there's, there's some that's a reality. And the reality is the ones that get audited, get checked, and those are real numbers. So, so let's let's talk art versus science here uh, yeah. of, in, of, of investing. And, and you are active on Twitter. Um, Rob is at omnipotent32 is his... <laughs> Uh, Twitter handle. Uh, I am uh, footnotes first. Uh, and Rob chimes in with uh, uh, fantastic stuff. Um, but but watching, monitoring the, the Twitter flow as I see, and I see people talking about individual companies. And as I mentioned earlier, I don't. Um, uh, I, or I mentioned earlier in the podcast before you came on, I think. I don't talk about the individual names. Um, uh, but I'm happy to share whatever macro insights I might have. Um, but uh, the, you know, a, a lot of stuff I see is is management said, management said, and the presentation uh -huh. says, and management yeah. said. And now, Rob, my, you know, you may not know this, but my the first half of my 20 plus year career in the hedge fund world, I was a dedicated short seller. So um, <laughs> I wake up in the morning looking for things um, that possibly are are not accurate, and and that's how I originally came toward at the uranium case. I said, well, it's a you know. It's gotten destroyed. Let me see if I can prove the bear case. If I can, I'll go home because I'm not going to short something down 95%. And I couldn't. Um, but, but uh, you know, I, when you're a, a lot of times, and I and I I see it on Twitter. You, when people are investing in in any company, any industry, you got to do your own work. Number one, and you've got to understand. Uh, and not everyone has the skill or interest or desire to to do that, but especially in the mining space, where I, I often tell people, I say to people, mining is similar to the biotech industry, where um, they're issuing equity a lot, and they're raising money all the time. And you, you can't raise money, right? For, for biotechs, they're doing it because they got to do the next round of R&D, uh, research and development. And for miners, they got to go drill, and they got to go find stuff. Um, and so you, you always got to be a little careful when you're looking at at, at at any company, right? Because they do put their best foot forward in these presentations. I mean, uh, I get to know management teams, and I like I like many of them personally. But I'm always kind of stepping back and saying, okay, does this make sense? I mean, you've been around this the mining industry for a long time, um, so I mean, what would you say to listeners who are not professional investors, but they kind of get the thesis? 
how do you how do you avoid some of the land the, the landmines that are out there? That that's that's very difficult for the retail investor real access, frankly. And I've had this conversation with a few people on Twitter, uh, more offline, but I, I have. Um, the, the problem that many people run into is, especially in an opaque business, as you've mentioned for uranium, there is a yeah. lot of knowledge that is not readily available. And there's a, no, a lot of knowledge out there where people are just not willing to share it because either they make money off of it on their own, so they're not going to share it for free, or there's no incentive for them to share it because it could hurt their own position in some way, shape, or form. So it, yeah. it is incredibly difficult, and I, and I actually feel sorry for the regular investor looking at it because they just don't have this access. They can't just call up company A or supplier B or utility C like I can just to find out the information because they'll tell me and I won't yep. uh, wreck them, for so to speak. That being said, my number one uh, suggestion would be stop looking at the internet for suggestions. Everyone has a reason for saying what they say, probably including me. So always find out how someone is getting paid when they tell you something is the first thing I say. Because I see a lot of stuff where I just cringe thinking, I can't believe someone is recommending A because of B, because I think it's just frankly not even truthful. But they, they say it and people believe it because they're out there talking. And, you know, if, if there's enough people say it or if, if some people say it and they look like they're reputable, they go for it. Yeah, um, the power of incentives, right? You got to understand what people are motivated by. Exactly. So even, even with my own uh, I don't even give tips, but even my own suggestions, people should try to figure out if I have any possible reason to say certain things. Um, I like to think I don't, but still investigate it because you should. But, uh, but, but it's important. So I think investors should really look at the company itself and look at the financials, look at what's actually reported there, and then compare it to what everyone else is doing in the area. If one person says, they, if, the, if company A is saying they're doing incredibly well, and company B right beside them has higher numbers, why is A better than B? Don't just believe blindly that A is just going to be better than B because it is. There's got to be a reason. Is the grade better? Is it, is, if it's ISR, is, is, is the uh, mobility of the minerals better? Or is there's got to be a reason, right? But yep. at the end of the day, it's all costs in my opinion, and grade matters. So companies like Fission and NextGen with the really high grades look great. Chemical looks great because they have high grades. That solves everything. Mm -hmm. um, but... Other than that, there's there have to be other reasons to why a comp why one asset is supposedly pretty good, and and that actually um, lends itself to the whole acquisition comment because I, I see comp people talking about well, X company just bought Y asset. This is fantastic. Uh, this should make the company go uh, much stronger. Well, as a former analyst, I'd always think well, someone has to be selling this thing. Yeah. So why <laughs> selling? Right. Yeah. Like why, why is company X so much smarter than company Z who's selling it? Company Z has more information. They own it. So why are they selling it? There's got to be a reason why they're selling it. And that's really important to find out if Z is in trouble and they need to get rid of assets. Sure. But they would still not get rid of their best asset. They get rid of their worst ones if they can, but maybe they won't be able to sell it. But that thinking process has to go through as opposed to just thinking, oh, great. They bought this instant $10 million extra valuation, instant $50 million extra valuation. It doesn't work that way. So yeah. it, it has to make a lot of sense, and I think that's something that investors really need to do is dig in, try to find someone they trust who has no agenda, uh, and uh, and see what they think, uh, and definitely look at what others are saying, what what others in the area are doing, and compare. One of the things I always ask, or one of the best questions I learned from one of my colleagues when I was on the buy side was, you speak with the CEO of company A, you ask them, what is your favorite company outside of yours in the space? And then they could get a chance to talk about some other guys. And then you get to hear a more truthful opinion about other people. Right? That's a great question. If you have access to management, ask them that question. Rob, Rob that's, that's, that's one of the best questions to ask. And, and you get to see it on, on a couple of fronts. A, you get to see their knowledge of the industry. And, and it's such a wide spectrum in the, in the uranium space. There are some guys I talk to who can tell you about all many of the projects that their competitors, if they're in the same area or other parts of the world, then there are other guys who you could tell just aren't engaged, right? And it's it's such yeah. a great barometer on on how to do that. And then there's other guys who are out there just slamming com every other company. And you know it's interesting. I, I see that more in industries, and I noticed it in uranium early on years ago when I started looking at it and talking to the CEOs. Um, they're fighting in a downturn as brutal as this. They're all fighting for that 
last bit of investor capital willing to keep them afloat. And so it almost, be I noticed, God, it's become sport. They all beat the crap out of each other saying how everyone else's projects suck. And um, I, I, I mean, but but your question, I think, is just spot on in terms of, uh, of uh, ask them who they like. Yep, that's a great point. What, what uh, you know, one of the things we didn't touch on and I'd like to, to kick around. And, and so, so some of the things that when I started looking at the industry back in 15, now I had looked at it throughout my career, but not intimately. Um, looked at it in 07 at the peak from a short perspective, clearly missed that. Um, but, you know, I was looking at 15 different industries and had a lot going on and analysts working for me. And it just wasn't a focus. Uh, looked at it in uh, post Fukushima as a, as a as a potential long early on after uh, Fukushima went down and uh, I didn't uh, I didn't get involved and so but but as I started peeling this onion back and I started looking at it and one of the things that became clear to me was a, a lot of commentators on the industry were not talking about secondary supply it was easy to find primary mine supply information, but the you know the the big swing factor. So you have you mentioned it earlier. You have primary mine supply has trailed uh, demand for for years and years and years, decades, many decades, and and so it's filled up. The balance is filled up for either inventory or secondary sources of supply, and one of the big secondary sources, as you know, obviously uh, from '93 to 2013, was the megatons to megawatts program where the Russians were down blending highly enriched uranium in 22,000 intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, to low enriched uranium and selling it to the Americans. And that, in some years, that was as high as 20 million pounds. And in, in the world of uranium and demand supply, that's a big number. And so that, that and, and post Fukushima, you still had a couple of years where that was pounding the market where the, uh, the Japanese reactors went offline. Um, and then, uh, you know, you have some MOX, mixed oxide fuel, that is also a source of secondary supply. For a while, there were some Japanese inventories hitting the market. But then you had the Department of Energy in the U.S. paying for uh, uh, the cleanup of two of their gaseous diffusion plants that were closed, and they didn't have it as a line item in the budget, so they started to sell some excess uranium into the market. But the big 800-pound gorilla was in this at the, at the enrichment plant, uh, where they were able to underfeed and just... Uh, basically, I'll, I'll, I'll shortcut this for those of you listening for the first time. It, uh, the, the nuclear fuel cycle goes from comes out of the ground, it gets uh, processed into something called yellow cake, it gets sent off to a converter, uh, it's turned into UF6, then it goes to get enriched so that uh, un, you know four four percent or so for nuclear power, ninety percent or uh, and above for making bombs. Uh, but it's 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 there that has created a real headache for investors uh, for for mining companies, uranium mining companies. Uh, it's created a real problem. And and there's a process. The, the way the contracts work is the 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 uranium miners deliver uranium into the converter, and the only thing they care about is at the end that the nuclear power plant gets the amount of uranium in the form of fabricated fuel pellets that they need. And the nuclear power plant only cares that they get those five billion pounds a year or whatever number it is that they're using. So, but but in that process, the way the technology works at the centrifuges, and Rob, you know all this, but I'm just uh, uh, getting getting there for those of who don't know it. Uh, the 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 enrichment plant, if they have some slack demand, and they work off of a unit called a separative work unit, it's called SWU, and and if they have some excess capacity. They could spin those centrifuges longer, and they uh, when they're uh, 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 enriching the uranium, and they actually can extract some more enriched uranium product, some some end end product that they can then sell off into the nuclear power plants. They can sell their fabricators, and and they can and and so they basically think about it like an orange juice machine. If you needed a gallon, you'd squeeze a bunch of oranges. If you needed a little bit more, you could keep squeezing and getting some more. Well, when they have this excess capacity and, ex and excess separative work units, they have the ability to do that. And there were some years where it's putting 20, 25 million pounds a year into the market. And, 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 and an enrichment plant has very, very high cost to build and very, very low cost to operate. Very low cost of electricity, especially with the new technology, the centrifuge technology. An old gaseous diffusion plant had 10x the amount of uh, electricity costs. So this secondary source of supply has been pounding the market. And 
And now we're starting to see, and one of the things I spend a lot of my time on is understanding that excess source. Now, I believe that because of where the tail assays are, which is the uh, uh, where they're spinning that uranium down to, and I won't get into a physics conversation here, um, but you're at, you're at the lower bounds of, of where you can go. Uh, 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 an eastern centrifuge, uh, the Russians would... Sp their centrifuges are designed to go down to 0 0.1, and the Western centrifuge can go to 0 0.17. And when you look at market shares, you're sitting at about 0 0.14 if you blend those two. And the tail assays today are sitting at 0 0.15. So they can't go much lower um, uh, uh, from spinning a tails assays. And then if they were to try and even go lower, if they could figure a way to do it, the more... Uh, the lower you go down on the tail assays, the more SWU capacity you use. And I think that's why we've seen SWU, which was as high as 175 to 200 back during the peak in, in, in the heyday. Now it's sitting in the high 30s. So very long-winded way of saying the biggest source of secondary supply, which is has been underfeeding. Uh, you can make an argue, a very strong argument, I think, that that's somewhat uh, uh, starting to either abate or it has at least peaked. I think it's abating and I think it's gonna come down. But how come Rob, and, and I know you know this and you've talked about it in the past, but why do you think when I started, you know, three years ago and I was really diving into this space, why did I have such a hard time from other commentators not talking about this significant source of excess supply into the market? What What is it about the enrichment process that seemed to got, get lost on the market during this prior during this long downturn? I, I think the long explanation that you just did is the reason why it's difficult for many people to understand it. it, it it's because it's technical. Uh, it requires some time to get your head around it. And for investors who may not be used to it or not maybe as committed to try, trying to figure out, it's a difficult concept to, to understand. Um, I, and I'm, I'm glad you're using the juice example because I, I heard that many years ago and I've used it ever since. And it's been a great tool for me to, to tell people how this whole thing works by using number of oranges and how much juice yeah. I get out of it. So explain it. Um, and, and it really but, does. It kind of breaks it down, right? Because I've had people say to me, g g explain the physics. First of all, I'm not a physicist. But second of all, I spend enough time in it to understand, like, hey, this is kind of how it works, I think. Uh, but but it, it is it is a fascinating thing. And because the, the, because the fuel cycle has so many stages and it's so complicated that there are ways to really just – pick off, if you will, sentiment and, and consensus. And, and what struck me when I, when I really first started looking at space three years ago, what I liked was at one point in time in the 07, I think the market cap of the industry was 130 billion. Then it was 60 billion around Fukushima, something like that, something crazy. And then when I started looking at it, it was four and a half billion dollars with one company in uh, half the market cap. And what that told me was, there's not a hedge fund on the planet, really, any, of any size, and on size I'm talking a billion, two billion plus, that could invest in the sector because Agreed. they would have to own the whole company, right? And you know this from being on the sell side, right? W during the boom years, you're going to see the big hedge funds come out, and they're going to be having their analysts spending time getting up to speed. But during the downturn and the market caps of the companies are so small, they can't own enough of the company to make a difference, so they disappear. And then on your smaller hedge funds, unless you're a natural resource fund, and I know you dealt with those up in Canada, but unless you're, if you're a generalist hedge funds, which most are, there's many, many more of them than there are natural resource funds, and you're running 50, 100, 200 million dollars, and you're a generalist fund, you're not in the business of catching falling knives, and you don't have the manpower to devote to learning this very complicated topic. And there were only, during the downturn, there were only a few guys left. You were, you were one of the last guys in the sell side who understood this and were talking and educating people, a lot of the desks had closed, the trading desk, a lot of sell side analysts had gone. And so there's this like void of information. But when you think about s secondary supply, uh, I mean, when, when you're looking at it, and I know you're, you're from, from watching your re, uh, tw Twitter feed, you're rather bullish. How are you thinking about secondary supply in your mental calculus? I, I, I do follow it pretty closely, and fortunately for me, but unfortunately for others, I rely heavily on my contacts to get a good sense of where the numbers are, because it's probably the most opaque of the entire business is the secondary supply situation. Um, I, I do follow it. I do agree with you. I think the enrichment source 
has pretty much peaked or will will no longer be as big of an issue as it as, as it was because it's just based on math and based on science, it just cannot squeeze out any more than it currently is doing right now. Yeah. Um, I, 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 and I do believe that we're going to have significant increase in demand that will overwhelm supply from any direction, primary or secondary. Uh, yeah. But I, I believe that there is going to be a bit of a wind down, not only just from the enrichment side, but uh, the, the, the the DOE selling of the material has has abated, has significantly declined. Yeah, that's, that's it. They put that on hiatus. Yes, well, that's just like fantastic getting the the, uh, the annual or semi-annual chicken in the pants that they would give us all the time by uh, yep. by selling a whole bunch. Uh, so, so I think secondary supplies are are slowing down. And, and actually, and, and this isn't specifically related to what you said, but uh, it's sort of related because it is a supply source. Many people think that Japan, the inventories that they have, could be sold back out into the market very easily and impact the market. It, it's not as simple as people think, uh, and I wanted to highlight that. Reason being is that utilities usually held, hold it in fabricated fuel assemblies. And one fuel assembly doesn't necessarily fit into another one. Generally speaking, you can't just take one and throw it into another. So if someone was really willing to buy the uranium that a Japanese utility may be selling if they had to, they would yeah. actually have to incur the additional cost of not only getting it from them, but, but disassembling the entire thing and refabricating the entire thing. So with uranium prices low, it, you could argue that it would, they might as well just buy it from the regular sources and not have to deal with the Japanese uh, uh, inventories because it would cost them a lot more, unless the Japanese utilities are willing to sell it for major discounts, which I guess is possible. But they, they see things the same way we do in that they believe that uranium prices are going to be significantly higher in the future. So unless they're in complete distress, it's unlikely that they'd be willing to sell it at a big discount right now, knowing that in five, six years, they have to buy it back at significantly higher prices later. But yeah, yeah, that's that's a tangent that I just took on that you might not be want, wanting me to take. No, no, that's that's great. So, so last last question for you, Rob, is two thirty two, sure. section two thirty two, uh, and and uh, I have to ask you, you're on the board of UR Energy, and they were, are one of the two petitioners that petitioned the United States Department of Commerce on the grounds of national security from uh, uh, section two thirty two, which was uh, put on the books in nineteen sixty two, I believe it was. Uh, where if an industry is in distress because uh, and it's it, you can make the case that there's national security interests at heart, uh, then you should uh, be able to get some relief. And Energy Fuels and UR Energy uh, uh, petitioned the Department of Commerce, and their argument is uh, the U.S. consumes 30 percent of the world's nuclear power. It's 20 percent of our electric grid, and we import 98 percent of the uranium that we use. And yep. if there's not some sort of relief, and we import it from state-owned entities that are selling at lower cost, um, what's your view now on 232? And, and Commerce has until April to make a decision. Um, um, but but w can you talk uh, your view of, of Section 232 and, and where it goes from here? Right. Uh, I, I can't speak too much into detail because it is something that we're, we're live on, and uh, I'd rather right. defer to Jeff to, to sure. speak on your energy and, you know, that, and I am on the board. Uh, on a more higher level, I do agree yep. with the concepts of uh, of 232. Um, and just looking at security of supply, just making this more of a, a security issue. When you look at global uranium production, one could argue that Russia has influence to up to about half of global production. If you yep. count its current production and all the former states or countries that Russia has some influence over, you could argue that Russia can control up to 50%, if not more. And for, for Americans who are concerned with, with something like that, protecting domestic uh, production would certainly be top of the list in my mind. So I, I believe that uh, it is relevant. It may not be the most economic thing right now to do because you are supporting an industry that's not as economic. But when you mm -hmm. look at the potential of having someone possibly, not saying it's, it's easy, but it's possible if they could influence 50% of uranium to suddenly be not available, that would be pretty crippling, especially yeah. if 20% of U.S. power. So I, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. Great. Real quick, before I let you go, I see, uh, and I had, uh, you are the CFO of a blockchain company. And I, by the way, I know nothing about cryptos, <laughs> blockchain. Uh, the publisher of the podcast, Frank Curzio at Curzio Research, uh, he publishes this podcast. And I know Frank has uh, uh, a, uh, a newsletter he calls uh, Curzio Crypto Intelligence, I think it is. And he's always talking to me. He's excited about blockchain and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, Frank, I, I get I get a blank look, but he, I know he's working on so many interesting things. What? Tell me wh wh why blockchain and what uh, what are you doing there? 
Uh, well, blockchain, I'm, I'm excited about. I think we're sitting at the same point as the beginning of the internet in terms of how transformational the internet was to the world. I believe blockchain, with its uh, with its uh, dis, uh, with its ledger system and its dispersedness, is a distributed ledger rather. I'm not saying we're yeah. with distributed ledger system where security can be spread out and there's no centralized control. I think yeah. that will be transformational for all sorts of industries, for security reasons, for anything from potentially ordering an Uber to controlling supply chains to securing currencies, which is what we're seeing the most uh, active use right now. I just think that this technology will transform the world and it will, uh, and, and right now we're at the, the first or second inning of that, really just the first inning of that. Uh, with my own company, Riot Blockchain, I am the CFO of it. Uh, we do have, we, we're unique in that we have a mining operation as well as uh, a few investments in, uh, in uh, exchanges as well as um, uh, accounting and, um, and also a uh, smart contract system, which is a way for payments to be exchanged universally without having to mm-hmm. negotiate on a contract by contract basis, uh, as well as we have an exchange. So it's, it's exciting, uh, given that we're one of the more diversified businesses, companies within that business. So I'm, I'm excited. And I'd like Great. to think that I'm actually connected into two of the most uh, interesting sectors being blockchain and uranium. So hopefully they both take off. That's great. Well, good luck with that. And I, I really appreciate your time. It was, it was good to catch up and, uh, and, and talk uranium. Oh, it was a pleasure. Anytime. Great. Thanks, Rob. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Rob Chang, a longtime veteran of the uh, uranium space and a uh, very knowledgeable guy about uh, understanding the industry. And he's seen boom and bust before. He's seen it in this, in this industry. Uh, I apologize if you heard any background noise. So I have a, 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 those of you who don't know, I'm technologically clueless for the most part. Uh, and uh, my computer uh, was uh, acting up on me. So I, I took it uh, to a part of my home where uh, um, I don't, I was on Wi-Fi and not the uh, hooked into the wall. And so it could have been a little choppy. Uh, you might've heard my dog my my seven year old golden retriever Annie uh, running around, and I apologize if you heard that. And you might have heard my house phone ringing because I don't know how to shut it off. So uh, if we if you could get past that, I hope you enjoyed the show. I just want to let you know that I, I am the co founder and chief investment officer at Sachem Cove Partners LLC. And due to industry regulations, I don't discuss any of Sachem Cove's funds on this podcast. And And all the opinions expressed by the podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Sachin Cove or its affiliates. And this podcast is for informational purposes only, and it should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Clients and or affiliates of Sachin Cove partners may maintain positions in securities discussed on this podcast. And uh, I will be back next week. Uh, I don't think we'll be speaking Uranium, but we will have another interesting guest. So I hope you have a great week. And uh, it, I, like I said, if I could recommend... Oh, oh, before I forget, I watched the Jack Ryan series on Amazon. It's awesome. Really liked it. Now, I, I'm a big Jack Ryan. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the whole series. But I, it's eight episodes. Uh, it's actually season one. They're coming out with another one. So uh, I highly, I, I definitely recommend it. It's, 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 it's a great, it's a great watch. So have a great week and I'll talk to you next week. Thanks. The information presented on Talking Stocks Over a Beer is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decisions solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility.